Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing good this morning. Just want to welcome you all. Thank you so much for coming out on this weird, snowy, rainy, whatever it is day. I don't know exactly what it's doing out there, but it's good to see you all here in the house of the Lord this morning. Glad you all are safe coming, and we do want to welcome everybody through Facebook as well. Just thank you all for joining in. Let's go ahead and stand and uh, go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we bless your name today. We glorify you. We declare that you are the name above all names, that at your name, Lord, demons tremble, and I know this. God, I just pray that as we are gathered in your house today that you would move and minister in our midst. God, I pray that you would speak through Pastor Todd as he brings the message. Uh, anoint him. God, anoint our ears that way we, we can receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Count on one thing, the same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God that's never late is working all things out. He's working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the Lord. Valley, yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy. Fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the way The same God that's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will meet you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. his name in this house. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. And when the darkness falls, it won't God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. 
There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. And every war he wages, he will win. So I'm not backing down from any giant. Cause I know how this story is. Yes, I starts to tremble at the light that you bring but when you walk into the room every heart starts burning and nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship Jesus. 
Lord, we thank you and worship you when you walk into the room. Sickness starts to vanish, every hopeless situation ceases to exist. When you walk into the room, the dead begin to rise, cause there is resurrection life in all you do. All this is for you, Lord. Amen. Every song we sing, every word we speak, every action we take, Lord, God, let it be glorifying to you, Lord. We give praise, glory, and honor. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks be unto God who gives us the victory. Thank you, Lord, for the victory that was won on the cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed for our salvation that cleanses us and washes us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you, Lord, for your unconditional love. That while we were yet sinners, you still died for us. You still loved us. When we were steeped in sin, when we were in a place of the mucky, miry clay, Lord, you reached down and you brought us out. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that you didn't throw us away. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your kindness toward us your gentleness and your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for your compassions, for they fail not. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to be in your house today to worship you for those that are watching on Facebook, God. We thank you, Lord, for every person. We thank you, Lord, for your love. Reach out and touch each person today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. We're going to partake of 
Holy Communion this morning. And uh, if you will, turn with me, if you want, in Luke chapter 22. The Bible tells us, gives us instruction before we partake of Holy Communion to examine ourselves. Get everything under the blood of Jesus. If there's any sin, if there's any hard feelings, put it under the blood of Jesus Christ and be forgiven. Amen. Let's take a moment right now just to personally, individually pray. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, as Jesus is together with his disciples in the upper room, in verse 14 it says, And when the hour was come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, With desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. If you will, take this wafer and... Just break it. As Jesus' body was broken for us. If you will, let's all take together and eat. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The body that was broken. This do in remembrance of me. Thank you, Jesus. We remember. Lord, help us to never forget. Help us to never forget. Likewise, also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the New te Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. If you will, let's drink of, of the fruit of the vine today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And they sang a hymn after they had communion together. We're going to sing together. Is that right? Thank the Lord for this blood today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus
Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. If you would Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 25, we're going to go straight into the Word of God today. Thank you, praise and worship team. Let's give them a hand this morning for they do a great job. Praise God. And our sound people and everybody that helps out with that and media and uh, let's give them a big hand too. Let them know. We appreciate them. Amen. Matthew 25, verse 14. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. And he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged it in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them, and so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. This Lord had said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliveredst unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. This Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at, the, at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given... And he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for the power of your word. Lord, let it speak into our lives today. 
God, let it speak to us to see our responsibilities today, what you've called us to do. And Lord, to do it with all that's within us. Lord, to do it with everything that we have. God, we pray, Lord, that you'd help us not to be slothful, help us to not be a bad steward of the things that you've entrusted to us. But Lord, help us to be trustworthy and help us to be like the one that brought five more back with the five that he received. And two, and two more back. And help us to hear you say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, that's what we long to hear, is to finish this race, to cross the finish line, and to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, that's what we long to hear. We don't want to hear you say, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. We don't want to be separated from you forever. And Lord, help us to take the seriousness of the responsibility that we have today. Help it be gray, great gravity up on our hearts today and on our minds. Lord, let it, let it just touch us today, God, and help us to see how responsible we are. We need your touch today. I need your anointing. Your help, Lord. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Help us all today, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You can be seated. Did you know that God has placed trust in us? The last week we talked about entrusting and putting trust in others and taking it from one generation to the next and and sharing what the word of God is and the responsibilities and knowing that we're not going to be here forever but we've got to take this now and pour it into the lives of other peoples and so God has placed trust in us and we're given responsibilities that that we have to fulfill and and to oversee and to return back a return on the investment, if you want to call it that, that God has placed in us and that we bring back to him an increase of what he has given to us. This is called stewardship. It's called taking those things that he's entrusted with us, taking good care of it, bringing it back to him with more than what we started with. That's taking it responsibly. And we realize that we only have this for a period of time, for the time that we're here, for the time that we live upon this earth. And what we have, we really don't own it. And sometimes we get confused because we think we own. We think we've done all this. We think we've created all this, but we don't own it. We don't own what we have but we are trustees of what God has given to us. And today we're going to look at the role of a trustee and the responsibility of a trustee. And knowing that it has a great responsibility, and we're going to look at a particular trustee here in a few minutes by the name of King Ahab who was the king during the time of Elijah and Elisha in the book of 1 Kings and into 2, well, 1 Kings. I think it ends with him in 1 Kings. But he was a man that had great responsibility. Ahab was responsible for being the king of Israel. Not only was he having responsibility of kingdom work, he had responsibility in his family. He had responsibility to be a husband and to be a father to his children. And all of us, in some way or another, is a trustee. All of us have been given a responsibility for us to take and do something with it. So today, as we're looking in the sermon series of In God We Trust, we're going to talk about the trustee. And so a trustee is a person who manages the assets of another, per or another entity or a person. And a trust can be something that is, uh, a trustee can be either a person 
or it can be an entity. You could have like a bank who is a trustee over, over an account, over assets. And it may be a trust that's set aside that a trustee is responsible to manage. And that with that management of it is to bring minimal risk to what's been entrusted and to bring a reasonable return. And so this person or these people, these trustees make investments and they distribute property and they make payments, etc. A trustee is never an owner of the trust but has the responsibility to take what's been entrusted and to use it wisely and to do something in accordance with the will of the person who put it in their trust. So you can look at that from a financial standpoint. You can look at it as someone who has a will. Someone dies. Their assets are put into a trust. The trustee now takes the assets according to what the will said to do with it and distributes it, disperses it, invests it, does whatever it needs to be done with it in accordance with the will of the person who owned it before. Being a trustee is the oldest profession in all of humanity. Some may be thinking of another profession that's been said as the oldest profession, but the oldest profession in all of mankind is a trustee. How do you know that? Well, when God created the earth and he put Adam in the garden and he created Adam in the likeness and the image of himself, he entrusted Adam to be responsible over all the creation. And he was the very first trustee that God put. And that was the very first responsibility that became in all of humanity. So Adam was to name the animals. And he was to take care of the garden. And he was entrusted with taking the care of God's creation. The Bible says in Psalm 24, 1, that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world is and they that dwell therein, so that we belong to God. So everything we see, everything we are come in contact with, even ourselves and one another, the Bible tells us that we belong to the Lord. So we are His. This is His. The earth is His. And, and Adam, in that role as a trustee, failed and didn't meet the responsibilities of the trustee. See, he failed to trust what God told him. God told him, this was the word of God. It was not written at that time, but at that time he told him not to eat of this tree. If you do, you shall surely die. And what did he do? He ate of the tree of knowledge, and, 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 and he did disobedience to the will of God the one who owned the tree I don't want you to do this don't do this I want you to do everything else that I've told you to do but do not do this and he broke trust and he failed in the role of the trustee and because a trustee's responsibility is to do the will of the owner and Adam disobeyed and he was kicked out of the garden. Now, did he lose the role of being a trustee altogether? No. He still had the responsibility, and it passes down from generation to generation for all of us to take care of God's creation. Amen? And to be responsible and not pollute it, not dirty it up, and to take care of one another, take care of the animals, take care of the different things that still entrusted to us. But with his responsibility and where he failed in this, God had consequences to his actions. So yeah, you're going to be a trustee, but it's going to be hard work now to be the trustee. It would have been a lot easier if he had just trusted God and he had done what God said and everything, there would have been no sin and there had been no consequences to his actions, but he didn't do that. And because he didn't do that, there were consequences and he now has to work and he has to labor with sweat on his brow. And, and Eve, his wife, now she's going to have to be submissive to Adam. And when she bears children, she's going to have to have pain with that childbearing. 
Not only that, they discovered and knew at this point they were naked before and didn't know it. Now they knew it, and to hide their nakedness, God killed an animal as a sacrifice, basically, and that blood that was shed, and that skin of that animal was put upon them, and now they were clothed. But they no longer were able to enter back into the Garden of Eden. They were kicked out of the garden. And an angel stands there or stood there at that garden preventing them from being able to go back in. See, we have a responsibility just like Adam has. We have a responsibility to take care of the earth. We have a responsibility to obey what God says to do with his creation. We have a responsibility to give our soul allegiance to God. To God. In God we trust. That he's first and foremost in our lives. And we have the responsibility to love other people and not to abuse them or cause them any harm. And God gave Moses, several years later, the Ten Commandments that basically says, these are your rules as a trustee. Your responsibility as a trustee is to now have no other gods before me and, and on down the list. And, and as you go down the list of the rules there, there are certain rules that apply to our relationship with God, the owner, but then there's relationships that's also responsible for us toward people. God's creation, what God owns. And we have a very serious responsibility. The youth are in a uh, s uh, study right now that they started last week about loving God and loving one another. And the Bible tells us that all the laws of the prophets hang upon this great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. When we do that, we can fulfill the role of being a good trustee. Because we will do what God has told us to do. This is his will. And we will reach out and we'll do those things in love as a trustee. But the question that I have for us is how many times have we been like Adam and failed in our responsibility? I have many times. And I must realize, and we all must realize, is that God will hold us accountable one day for what we do or we don't do and for what we've done as a trustee with what he's entrusted us. Adam was kicked out of the garden. Adam had to suffer. All of these things that I mentioned earlier, Adam now was dealing with the consequences. Trustees have a res great responsibility of loyalty and care to protect that which been in, has been entrusted to that person, to make wise decisions, to give back to the owner, what was given plus a return, as Jesus was talking about. And we can do this with great success if we trust in the one who owns it all. If we do it his way. If we'll follow his rules. If we trust God and we take him at his word and we obey his word and his instructions. But if we don't believe him, and we do it our own way, there will be consequences that we have to pay. All of us are trustees, and we all have great responsibilities. So turn with me over to 1 Kings as we look at the king that was in time of power with Elijah, the prophet that we've been talking about for the last few weeks. 1 Kings chapter 16. Verse 29 tells us a little bit about King Ahab. 
This is when he first entered into the reign as being the king. It says that it came to pass when he reigned that he smote all the house of... I'm sorry. Am I looking at the right thing? Nope, I'm in 15. Sorry. <laughs> and in the 38th year of king of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Omri to reign over Israel. And Ahab the son of Omri reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. So 22 years he was king. He was the son of Omri who was the king before him. And Ahab the son of Omri did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if he had if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So he really didn't care about what he was doing in his role as being the king. He took it lightly, his responsibility. He took it lightly that he was doing evil. He took these, this responsibility very lightly of him being the king and for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So not only did he take lightly the responsibility of being the king, but he took, respons he took lightly what God had told the people of Israel not to intermarry with others from outside of Israel and bring in pagan religions into the nation. But he didn't consider that either. And so he married a woman by the name of Jezebel, who was the daughter of the king of the Zidonians, and she was a prophetess of Baal, and she brings in her influence of worshiping Baal into Israel. And Ahab took what she brought in, and they built up altars. It says, and he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria, and Ahab made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So Ahab is the heir to the king of Israel. And it's his role as the king to make sure that the nation of Israel is protected from any enemies. Kind of like what the president of the United States is. To protect and defend against enemies foreign and domestic that come against this nation. Well, that's the king's responsibility. That was the king of Israel's responsibility to protect Israel, to help it to prosper, to preserve its heritage of what it had been brought, of, of being, these, being the, the people of God, God's chosen nation, and to obey the commandments of God and fulfill his will as the leader and the trustee of Israel. So he was the king, and he had a great responsibility as the king. But he's also a married man, and he was a husband. And as a husband, it was his role to be the leader in his home and to love his wife and to share the responsibilities with her, but also as the husband and the man of the home to be accountable for the actions of his family. Kind of like Adam. Adam had to take responsibility for Eve's disobedience. And so he had a responsibility as a husband to lead the family, to love his wife. The Bible tells us in the New Testament for us to love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. So this is not a role of being domineering. This is not a role of of, of being abusive or anything like that. This is a role of love that the Lord has placed us in as husbands in our, in our marriages. And not only that, but he was a father and he was given children. He had sons. And he was their father. And he had the responsibility as a father to raise his children in the right way. Because his children would only be with him for so long and then they would grow up and then eventually one of them or two or three or whatever as time went on would eventually be his heir. 
and be the heir of Israel and the king. And so it was his responsibility to instill and to entrust his, young, his children with, with the things of God, the right things of, of putting this into their lives that when he no longer was here or in his role, they would now be a trustee who would be responsible to run on with what had been entrusted to him. King Ahab was entrusted with the precious assets that belonged to God. And it was his responsibility to return them back to God someday better than what he received them. But Ahab failed as a trustee. And he did, did, did not return the things that God had placed in his trust back to God in better shape than what he got it. Israel was in a worse shape when he left. His wife was in a worse shape when he, when he dies. His children are scandalous rascals. He failed in his role as a trustee. He was an evil king, and he did what was wrong in the sight of God. And he married a woman who was evil too. And, and he brought that religion and he did the things that, that were contrary to what the will of God was for the king of Israel. For the king, for a husband, for a father. He did all these things in contrast to the will of God. And he fails. He fails as a trustee. In chapter 16, verse 33, it says, And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. He failed as a trustee. Ahab failed to trust and obey God. And he considered it a light thing, the Bible said. He considered his responsibility and did not take it seriously in the way that it deserved to be taken. He did not respect God's will, God's wishes. He did not obey him in doing what was right and not doing what was wrong. He acted as if he owned it all, that he was entitled to this, that this belonged to him. He had done this. He was spoiled so to speak. And he thought that everything that he had was his. And everything he wanted to have was his too. So he had that desire in him and a wrong mindset to think about everything else and what he was a trustee over that he felt like that he was an owner of it. But what he doesn't realize is that even though he was king of Israel... Israel still belonged to God. Even though he was the king in the kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of Israel belonged to God. Even though Jezebel was his wife, the marriage belonged to God. The institution of marriage belongs to God, even when we pervert it. The institution of marriage is still a God thing. And when we place God in the center of it, marriages go the way they're supposed to go. Amen? And his children were to be raised to serve God, but he fails at this. He did not take God seriously, and he did not trust in him. And Ahab was not perfect, and none of us are. And how many times have we, th have we hung on or clung to the things that we have a responsibility to entrust and we think we're the owners of it? Huh? We own our money. We own our house. We own these things. Well, my name's on the deed. It's in my bank account. It's in my pocket. It's in my investment account. It's mine. No. You've been entrusted it. Well, this is my family, and I'll do whatever I want to do with my family. 
And if I want to do this, I'll do that. And if I don't want to do this, I won't do that. These are my kids, and I'll do whatever I want to do. Wrong. They belong to God. We have a responsibility as a trustee to do the right things with what we've been entrusted. But we never are the owner of these things. Jesus said that at the very beginning we read. He gave five talents. He gave two talents. He gave one talent. He is the giver. Remember the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God is the one that owns it all. And Ahab was not perfect. And none of us are. But he had a major fault. Now I'll tell you what his major fault was. He had a problem with the word no. <laughs> he, had the pro he had a problem with the word it's in O. Not with yes. He, he liked the word yes. He liked to hear yes. He, he liked yes to be the response that he always got. And, and what he wanted, yes, you can have this. And what you want to do, yes, that's what you can do. And, and what, how that you want to do this, yes, that's okay, King Ahab. He had a problem with the word no. But as a trustee, you can't always say yes. You have to say no sometimes. And sometimes you have to hear no. Why? Because this doesn't belong to you. It's not for us to do whatever we want to do with what we've been entrusted. It belongs to God. It's not for us to do our own will with what we've been entrusted. It's for us to do God's will with what we've been entrusted. So sometimes God says, no, 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 that's not what I want. And I want you to do it this way. Now we can rebel and we can be disobedient and pay the consequences. Or we can obey and we can do what God says and we can be blessed in that. Whatever it is, whatever he's entrusted to us, and to some he gives more than he does others. But everybody's at least got one talent. Now, I'm not talking just about maybe you can sing and maybe that's the talent. But everybody's been given something by God that we have a responsibility now to take this and to use it for the glory of God. And when God, when we stand before the Lord someday, that we would take that one thing and at least doubled it and return it back to the Lord who gave it to us. That's our role. That's our responsibility. That's our job. See, Ahab had a problem with the word no. And it was difficult for him to say no. And, and as, as that trustee, you got to. And sometimes it's hard to say no to someone because we're afraid. What are we afraid of? We're afraid we're going to hurt their feelings. We're afraid that we're going to, they're not going to like us as a result. That's why sometimes as parents, we don't want to tell our kids no because we're afraid they'll get mad at us. We're afraid they're not going to like us if we tell them no, you can't go do, no, you can't go play out in the street with traffic coming. Well, I want to do that. And they throw a fit and all No, it's not good. It's not right. It's, it's dangerous. No. No, you can't hang out with these people. No, you can't do that. No, you can't stay out past this hour. No, you can't. You've got to have some boundaries. We've got to have boundaries. As a trustee, we're responsible to make sure that what we've been entrusted goes the right way. Even if it's at the expense of someone maybe not liking us or not liking what we had to say. As a man who took on a wife who was looking for one, the answer to Jezebel should have been no. No. No, you shouldn't marry Jezebel. No, she's going to take you down the wrong path. There are a lot of people who have married the wrong person in life. That if they had just done the right thing, at some point in their lives, they could have saved themselves a lot of hurt and harm and pain, but they decided they wanted to do what they wanted to do. As a result... It was pain. Now, I'm not saying anything, you know, 
We're none of us, none of us are perfect. And sometimes we make the wrong choices. We make the wrong decisions. So Jezebel was not the woman for Ahab. But he married her anyway. And God had given specific instructions of what you're to do and what you're not to do, but he didn't obey them. And he married her. And what he didn't realize probably when he saw that beautiful woman, Jezebel, and the allure that she had, that she had a controlling spirit about her. That she was a prophetess of Baal. She was a... a, 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 a a woman that was, that was going to lead him in the wrong direction. And she pressured him, I'm sure, because she wanted what she wanted. And she didn't like the word no either. And he buckles. Time and time again, we'll see him buckle under the pressure as a trustee to do what's right and then do what's wrong. He didn't have a relationship, a right relationship with God, obviously. And he gave in to the idea of worshiping a false god and even building altars up and groves when he would have, should have said what? What? No. No. The Bible tells me, the Ten Commandments, the Law of Moses tells me as the king of Ahab in the Old Testament I am to have no other gods before me. I'm not to make a graven image of anything and worship it. But he didn't do that. He should have said no, but he said yes. And his inability to say no in his marriage gets him in a lot of trouble through the years. And it causes a lot of problems for all of the people. As a father, he should have said no. To his sons that were doing evil things, he should have said, you cannot do that. But he did not. And he didn't tell them no. And they ended up doing evil things into the next generation. As a king in chapter 20 of the book of 1 Kings, if you want to turn over there with me. The king of Syria, who was in opposition to them, Ben-Hadad, gathered all his hosts together and 32 kings with him and horses and chariots, and, and they went up and besieged Samaria and warred against it. So Ahab, Ben-Hadad, ben the king of Syria, who was wanting to come in and invade Ahab and Israel, gathers a cohort of others, and they come in, to come against Ahab. And he sent messengers in to Ahab to tell him that, Ahab, your silver, your gold, your wives, your children, and even the goodliest are mine. I'm staking claim on this. I'm, I'm, I'm taking claim. I'm saying that this is now mine, Benadad was saying, the king of Syria. And how did Ahab respond? Did he say, no, it's not yours, it's mine. It belongs to God. These belong to God. This kingdom is God's. My wife, my marriage is God's. The children that I have are God's. The things that God has blessed me with are God's. No, he didn't do that. No, his response was in verse 4. It says, the king, answer, king of Israel answered and said to Benadad, my lord, O king. So he he, he submits himself over to Benadad, my lord, O king, according to thy saying, I am thine and all that I have. Now, that shows me some weakness in King Ahab. Because he was saying, you know, here comes this other king and 32 other kings with him saying, listen, Ahab, and he sends messengers, everything you have, your silver, your gold, your wives, your children, all, your, all everything you have is mine. And his response, because he had a problem with saying no, should have been, no, this does not, I am a trustee of this, this does not belong to you. It is my responsibility to make sure it stays in the hands of the owner of whom it belongs. But he didn't do that. He immediately submits himself over to King Benadad. We 
What are you doing, Ahab? <laughs> what, what are you thinking here? You, you are submitting and surrendering everything that you have been given trusteeship, that you are responsible for to take care of. You are submitting that, and all of a sudden, just because some enemy comes in and says they're mine, you're just going to roll over and play dead and let them have it. Ahab was not willing to have confrontation, so he did not say no. And he buckled to the pressure. And he always seems to buckle. He always seems to have no gumption about him, as far as that goes. To Jezebel, to the king of Syria, even to his own children. Uh, Ahab, you know... You have to learn to say no to some things. Everybody that's listening, every trustee that's within the sound of my voice today, even myself, sometimes you got to say no to things that come against what you are responsible to keep and to return back to God. Amen. There's a responsibility that we have to God. And we've got to learn to say no. There's some things we have to say no to, even if it's not what others want to hear. Even if it make others, makes others mad. If we are to take seriously the responsibility that God has placed in every one of us, He's placed trust in us. And if we take it seriously... We have to say no from time to time. And we have to say yes from time to time to God's will. Let me rephrase that. We have to say yes all the time to God's will. And no to things that are contrary to the will of God. To those that we're given responsibility, we have to say no sometimes. To the devil, we have to have a backbone about us spiritually. And when the devil says, I'm going to take your kids, I'm going to take your marriage, and I'm going to take everything that you own, we have to stand up and we have to tell the devil, no, you're not. No, you're not. You are not going to do this. I will not let you have my children. I will not let you have my marriage. I will not hand over the things that have been entrusted to me over to you. No, no, no. No. Can you say that with me? No, no, no. Now Ahab needed to not only to say no, but he needed to hear the word no sometimes. You see, when Benadad came back, he said he was going to take the possessions of Ahab's servants in verse 6. So Ahab... Ahab had a little bit of knowledge here to, th to do something right. He goes to the elders of, the, of Israel. And do you know what the elders tell him? You tell them no. <laughs> you tell them, we're not going to hearken to you, Benadad. You can't have what belongs to us. And, and you've got to do this. And, and thank goodness he reached out to somebody that had some wise counsel for him. Do you know that sometimes, as a trustee, we've got to have some wise counsel that we reach out to from time to time to make sure that we do what's right? Sometimes we may think something's right, and sometimes we may think it's wrong, and sometimes there's gray in the midst of that. In that area where we're having some confusion about things, there's safety there's in a multitude of counselors. And to be able to get counsel in in how to be a better parent or how to be a better father or how to be a better mother or how to be a better Christian or how to be a better minister or whatever it is, there's, there's wisdom to get godly counsel from people. And Ahab did the right thing here as he sought out counsel because they gave him wise counsel and they told him, no, you know, you tell them, that, that this is not, we're not, hearken not unto him nor consent, verse 8. And all the elders and all the people said unto him, hearken not unto him nor consent. 
say no. And Ahab does this, and he has to say that to Benadad. You know what Benadad did? Do you think Benadad just said, okay, well, that's okay. I just thought I would ask to see. <laughs> no, Benadad got angry. Benadad got all up, bent out of shape because Ahab finally told him no. And probably the biggest fear that Ahab had was to make someone angry by telling them no. But he had to tell Benadad because it was the right thing to do. And he tells him no, and Benadad does get angry with him. Sent unto him, it says, verse 10, uh, uh, um, let me go back to 9. Wherefore he said unto the messenger of Benadad, Tell my lord the king, all that thou didst send for thy servant at the first I will do. So I'll do what I said I'll do. But this thing I may not do. And the messengers departed and brought him word again. And Benadad sent unto him and said, The gods do so unto me. And more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people that follow me. And the king of Israel answered and said, Tell him, let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. And it came to pass when Benadad heard the message as he was drinking, he and the kings in the pavilion that he said unto his servant, Set yourself in array. And they set themselves in array against the city. They're ready to fight. And a prophet comes to Ahab in verse 13. It says, And behold, there came a prophet unto Ahab, king of Israel, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into thine hand this day, and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. So here comes the will of God to the trustee. When you look around and you see all these that are coming against you, I want you to know I'm going to deliver it into thine hand this day and thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Ahab hears what he says. But I think he has some doubt here as to God's ability. Because he said, by whom? <laughs> he had no thought that the Lord God would be the one that could fight for him. By whom? Who, who's going to do this? And no thought for his responsibility to go fight. By whom? And he said, Thus saith the Lord, even by the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall order the battle? This is Ahab talking. And the prophet said unto him and answered, Thou, you are going to do this, Ahab. You, this is your responsibility, Ahab. It's your responsibility to fight against those who are adversaries against you. You have an enemy. You've got to fight against your enemy. You can't roll over. You can't let things just be taken from you. You've got to stand up for what your responsibility is as a trustee, as the king, as a husband, as a father. Stand up. You're the one that's to do this. It's not somebody else's responsibility. It's not this person's responsibility or this one or this one or this one. It's not Jezebel's responsibility. It's not your children's responsibility. Ahab, it's you, thou. It's your responsibility. Todd, it's my responsibility. It's your responsibility, Todd. It's your responsibility, and you can fill in your name of what it is that God has entrusted to us and, and stand up and take the responsibility as the trustee of the land and the kingdom and trust in God. Don't let the enemy keep bullying you. Stand up. You had a spiritual backbone about you, Ahab. Stand up for what's right. Stand up and do what's right in a time, in a generation where things are going the wrong way, where they call good evil and evil good. Christian people, stand up for what's right. Say no to some things that need to be said no to. Say yes to the will of God in the name. Amen. Ahab did this. And you know what happened? They prevailed. <laughs> it 
It's funny how that when God says he'll do something, he does it. When the owner says, this is what will happen with what you do, if you'll do it my way, you will prevail. You'll have the victory if you do it my way, but not your way and not other people's way. When you do it my way, you'll have the victory. And Ahab, they had the victory, and they prevailed. And the prophet came to the king of Israel in verse 22 and said unto him, Go strengthen thyself and mark and see what thou doest, for at the return of the year the king of Syria will come against, up against thee. So he's like, you know, you had one battle, but guess what? A year later, he's coming back. He's coming back to fight you again. And, and how many times have we been in wars and spiritual battles where the enemy comes, but then you, th you get a victory, and guess what? He comes back again, doesn't he? He, he comes back, he starts bringing the ideas and things to remembrance and temptations and he does these things and, 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 and comes against us again and the prophet was saying he's coming back again next year. And it's interesting that of what the enemy was thinking because the enemy, the army of Syria was thinking, well, we fought them in the hills. They had a, the God of hills helping them. And that's why they prevailed. We'll take them to the valley. Let's go to the valley and we'll prevail over them. What well, they didn't realize that the God of Israel was the God of the hills and the valleys. Amen? He's the God of your mountain and your valley. He's the God of everything. He's our God, not only to Israel, but he's our God of our hills and our valleys. And no matter what weapon is formed against us as we sing that song, God will prevail against this. Whether we're on the high times of life and we have temptations that come. You know, there are temptations that come in our high points of life. Pride comes there. Temptation to be prideful. Temptation to be greedy and stingy in the high times. Temptation to be thinking of, of, of our own selves and our own abilities. But then we get down in the valley and we kind of go there and we start realizing and we start to humble ourselves. But in that time, we, we start to be tempted with depression and discouragement and all the other things and doubt and fear and worry. And there's all kinds of tactics that the enemy uses against us and thinks that he can prevail against us. And listen, he can prevail against us if we allow him to, if we disobey God and we do against the will of God. He can get a hold of us in some of this. But as the people of God and as a trustee who's responsible, we've got to go in the name of the Lord against our enemy and know that the Lord is the God of the hills and the valleys of our lives. And no matter what we face, victory is ours. We can go forth in victory because God has the victory. Amen. So they come, thinking that they can prevail against them. And a man of God comes again to Ahab. In verse 28, And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, and he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude in thy hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. I am the Lord. You shall know, Ahab. That's the same thing that the prophet said in verse 13. And you shall know, thou shalt know that I am the Lord. Two different times here the Lord is going to reveal himself as the owner. The Lord. The owner. The one who is in control. You shall know that I am the Lord. And again, they got the victory. You would think that Ahab would learn at this point that God's the owner. And you've got to do it God's way. And when you do it God's way, you prevail. You, you have victory. But the, you know what he did? He didn't learn that. And Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, the servants and messengers and different ones tell him, well, the kings of Israel have mercy. Why don't you ask him to spare you? And so 
he, again, has no the ability or the lack of ability to say no. Because here comes Benadad and said to him, verse 34, verse 33, we'll go back to verse 33. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, thy brother Benadad. So he now is even identifying himself as a brother with this guy. Go ye bring him. Then Benadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into the chariot. And Benadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from thy father I will restore, and thou shalt make streets for thee in Damascus, as thy father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send thee away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. So he made a deal with the devil. so to speak. He made a deal with Benadad, his enemy. Do you know what he was supposed to do to Benadad? Kill him. That's what he was supposed to do. That was his responsibility. This was the king of Syria, but he didn't do it. He made a pact with him, a covenant with him. Because Benadad came to him, and, and Ahab, being the nice guy he was, he couldn't say no to him. And again, he's manipulated to, to give up responsibility that he had as the trustee. To give over something that he didn't have the right to give over. And this time he does it, but there are consequences with it. See, when the, Lord, when the prophet came and said, Thou shalt know that I am the Lord, and he got a victory, and it was because of the Lord that gave him the victory, and then he did it again, and he said, You shall know that I am the Lord. I'm the owner. I am in charge. You shall know this. He's without excuse now. When you know to do good and you do it not, to him it is sin. When you now know and you have the responsibility and know what that responsibility is and who God is and you still do something beyond that, there will be consequences to our actions. And there were consequences to Ahab. Because here comes certain man of the sons of the prophets who came to him. And one of them came and he told him to, told this, uh, said unto his neighbor in the word of the Lord, smite me, hit me. And the man refused to hit him or smite him. And there were consequences to that guy too because he told him, you know, because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as thou art departed from me, a lion shall slay thee. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and slew him. He got killed by a lion because he disobeyed hitting that prophet. As the Lord, where the Lord was telling him to do so. There are consequences of disobeying, obeying the word of God. The will of God, what God tells us right here, this is the will of God. This is God's word, what God is speaking to us to do and not to do. And if we choose to disobey, there will be consequences to our actions. We fail to acknowledge him as the Lord, the owner. We go back to the parable that was read at the beginning, the one that came back with one parable who hid it in the dirt, came back, and the Lord was wroth with him. He was very upset with him. And there was a consequence to him not bringing back another one in addition to the one that he had been given. There were consequences. There are consequences when we don't follow through with the responsibilities that we have of what's been entrusted to us. Couldn't say no. So guess what? God was going to say no to him. Ahab, you're going to lose your kingship. And because you didn't take the life of Benadad, your life is going to be given in exchange. That's pretty <laughs> severe consequence, isn't it? Okay, Ahab, he doesn't like to hear no, though, either. So he doesn't like to say no, but he doesn't like to hear no. 
Because after God has sent a prophet to Ahab, and, and he had those victories, again, you'd think that he would learn something going forward, but he doesn't. Ahab had anything he wanted, really. He was wealthy. He lived in a house that was made out of ivory. I mean, that's beautiful. I mean, just he had riches. He had wealth. He had a wife. He had children. He had all these things. He had everything. The economy was going well. And so in Israel, he had, he had a good life. But he wanted the field of his neighbor, Naboth. I want that field. So he goes to Naboth. And, and, and he, he goes to him. And, and I don't, I'm not too critical of Ahab other than his covetousness, which was one of the things that the Bible tells us not to do, not to covet. He was coveting here the neighbor's field. But he does offer him some money or another field in replace of what he's been given. Do you know what Naboth, Naboth says to him? No. <laughs> Why? Because he said, this is my inheritance. Naboth was saying, listen, I am the trustee of this. My forefathers has been handed down to me. I'm going to say, no, I'm not, I'm not gonna, it's not for sale. And you know what Ahab did? He went back to his house. It's kind of funny to read it. Why don't we read it? Because it, it, it's, it's, he, just throws a, he just has a little big baby party. Naboth said to Ahab, The Lord forbid it me that I should give inheritance of the fathers unto thee. This is chapter 21, verse 3. And verse 4 it says, And Ahab came into his house heavy and displeased because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him, for he had said, I will not give thee the inheritance of thy fathers. And he laid down upon his bed, turned away his face, and would eat no bread and sucked his thumb, I'm sure. Because he, he was told no. He was told no by Naboth. He wanted that, though. Everything he wanted, he thought he could have. No. <laughs> Jezebel comes in. What's wrong with you? Well, I tried to get this over here. And you know what Jezebel does? She works up her own scheme. And you talk about how wicked this woman is. She has a couple of elders in town to bring an accusation against Naboth, and they stone him to death. Hey, honey, you know that field you wanted? I got it for you. Got it for you. Yours. Yours, honey. Nahab, he gets up, and he goes down to the field of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it in verse 16. And Elijah comes. The word of the Lord comes by Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he is gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick the blood even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, listen, and will cut off from Ahab, him that pisseth against the wall, and him that is shutteth, shut up and left in Israel. Your sons, your servants are going to be gone. I'm taking it all away from you, Ahab. And will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation wherewith thou hast provoked me to anger and made Israel to sin. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. 
Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Consequences. Pretty serious, isn't it? You, you have totally now ignored me. And see, there comes a place of judgment. When, when, a, when someone thinks they can do whatever they want to do and get away with it, are badly mistaken. Amen? So God doesn't take him immediately out, but he does take him out. And he comes over and he forms an alliance with Judah, with Jehoshaphat, in chapter 22. To go and to take Ramoth Gilead back from Syria. So he's going to go get back, and maybe he was finally getting a little backbone about him. We're going to go get and fight back for what belongs to us. So he calls for 400 of the prophets in Israel. And they make inquiry of, should we go to battle? And they all tell him, go up, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. They, they must have known he didn't like to hear the word no. Because these 400 prophets, God put a lying spirit in them, and they told Ahab what he wanted to hear and what God's plan was to draw him into battle. Jehoshaphat's like, is there not a prophet of the Lord that we can listen to, too? <laughs> you got these 400 prophets that's telling you everything you want to hear. Is there not a prophet of the Lord that will speak? Yeah, there's Micaiah. But I hate him. This is Ahab. You know why he hated him? Because he always speaks evil toward me. Everything he ever tells me, it's something I don't want to hear. That's verse number 8. It says, And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, the son of Emiah, by whom we may inquire of the Lord. But I hate him, for he doth not prophesy good concerning me, but evil. Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Then the king of Israel called an officer and said, Hasten hither, Micaiah, the son of Emiah. So here comes Micaiah, who who is going to uh, uh, be brought before the kings, and he's brought in, and they call upon him, and they ask him to prophesy what the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak, verse 14. Verse 15 says, So he came to the king, and the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the king shall deliver it into the hand of the king. Uh-oh. Uh huh. The Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? So he's like, Is this, are you telling me the truth? Or is this the truth that you're telling me? And Micaiah was just mocking the other 400 prophets and telling them whatever he wanted to hear. Ahab, you want to hear whatever you want to hear anyway, so I'll just tell you whatever you want to hear. Is this the truth? Are you telling me the truth? And then he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, These have no master. Let him return every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me but evil? <laughs> 
So what Micaiah was saying, listen, you're not going to prevail. You're not going to win, Ahab. You're going to lose in this battle. Israel's going to be scattered. They're not going to have a master. Your trusteeship is ending. It's ending. So Ahab doesn't dress in his kingly apparel because he doesn't want to be recognized as the king. And so as the Syrians are coming against them, they're getting ready to, to, to shoot an arrow toward uh, uh, Jehoshaphat, who was the king of Judah. And, and they were like, no, this isn't, this isn't him. This isn't him. And so all of a sudden, this, this, this warrior shoots an arrow, a rogue arrow. But God directed that arrow, and it went right into the heart of Ahab. And that evening, Ahab died. He was relieved of his duties as a trustee. We read at the very beginning the parable that Jesus spoke saying about the five talents, the two talents, the one talent. And he's speaking about, I'm giving you the kingdom of God. I'm putting this in your hands. I'm going to make you a husband. I'm going to make you a wife of a family, a godly family. I'm going to put children or a child in your trust. I'm going to give you a ministry to go perform. There won't be always people who like what you have to say. You're going to have to say no sometimes. You're going to have to hear no sometimes when you think that you own it all. But you know what? I want you to go. And I'm coming back. And when I come back, I'm going to see what you did with this. Do you know the Lord is coming back? He's coming back. And if, if he doesn't come back before we die, we're going to go meet him. Right? What do you want to hear him say? Yeah. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. Now I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. I think we have a perfect example of what not to do. <laughs> Amen? Through King Ahab gives us a perfect example of what not to do. But we can learn from King Ahab if we'll listen and we'll apply the Word of God to our lives, if we see the dangers, if we see the consequences that he had to pay, we can avoid those things. If we can realize the victory that can be ours because of the Lord in our lives. And doing the will of God, victory upon victory upon victory upon victory. Our ministries... Whatever God's given us can be the most successful that God wants it to be. We can return it back to Him and we can give Him even more than He gave us. I want to do that. How about you? We can do that if we do it His way. Because see, when we do things God way, God's way, the favor of God is upon us. The blessings, the anointing of God is with us. God opens doors that no man can open. And he shuts doors that no man can shut. God will do that for us. God will give us a life of blessings. Yeah, are you going to have an enemy to fight? Absolutely. But the Lord's going to fight the battle for you and you're going to prevail through him.
Will he come back and fight you again? Benadad did. Are you going to make a pact with your enemy or are you going to destroy that enemy in your life? What can we learn from Ahab? What can we learn as being a trustee of the riches of glory and the blessings that God has entrusted to us? The gospel message is in us. We've got a responsibility to share it. We've got a responsibility in our families. We have a responsibility with our children. We have responsibilities. You and I are trustees entrusted with things that God owns. What a raw, awesome responsibility that we have. Not to be taken lightly like Ahab did. Not to brush it off. Not to think that we can do it better ourselves. The Lord is going to give an account or take an account. We're going to give an account. It's interesting to see what he's looking for. Faithfulness. Faithful. Are you faithful to do? Are you faithful to me? Are you faithful to do what God's called you to do? Are you faithful to fulfill it? Are you faithful? Well done, good and faithful servant. Faithfulness. We all have a responsibility to love God and to love one another. And to be trustworthy with the things that God has entrusted to us. Why don't you stand with me today? Knowing that all of us have something that God has put in our trust. Whether it's one, whether it's two, whether it's five, whether it's ten, whether it's a hundred or a thousand or whatever it is, we all have responsibility to fulfill. And there may be some that are making wrong choices. Some that may be here today. Some that may be watching today. You're just going through life and you think you're never going to have to give an account to God someday. But we will. What did you do with your life? What are we doing with the things that God has put in our trust? What did you do with your marriage? What did you do with your children? What did you do in the kingdom of God? It's coming a day that we're all going to give an account. And when we do, will the Lord be pleased with what we've done, with what He's entrusted to us? Or will He say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. There may be some today that's never, never known him. Ahab really didn't know him. He got to know him more. I forgot to mention this. When he was that first time that the prophet spoke and said that he was going to die, you know what he did? He repented. He, he got himself in sackcloth and ashes and repented and prayed. And the Lord decided that he was not going to bring it during his life, these things. But after his life, these things would happen. Ahab was not going to have to see his children die. He was not going to have to see his wife die. But he still was going to die. See, Ahab got to know the Lord more. But did he ever have a relationship with God? A lot of people that know about the Lord, but do you have a relationship with him? Do you know him as the Lord? Do you know him as your Savior? 
do you know him as your owner, your master? Do you know him as your father? Do you know him as your best friend? Do you know him as your brother? See, that's what the Lord is wanting, is to have that relationship with us. If there's anybody here or anybody that may be watching today, if you don't have that relationship with with the Lord, the Lord wants to have that relationship with you. So if you will, just every head bowed and all eyes closed, if you will, I want to say a prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, there's a gravity to your word today. It's a heaviness because it helps us to see the responsibilities more than what we've seen before. Lord, we don't want to be irresponsible with what you've entrusted to us. Lord, we don't want our families to go the wrong way because we failed to do your will. We, want, we don't want to see our children rise up as rebellious against you, Lord. Wayward against you, Lord. We don't want to see our marriage fail because we didn't put you in the middle of it. We don't want to see the kingdom not progress because we were disobedient or didn't do our part. Lord, help us, all of us, to see our need and our responsibility as a child of God that's been given the riches of glory. We've got a responsibility to do something with it now. Take it and use it for your glory. Lord, if there's somebody that doesn't have a relationship with you today, Lord, let them turn to you with their whole heart, entirely to you, repenting, confessing their sins, acknowledging Jesus that you are the Son of God that died for them and rose again. Turn their lives to you completely. Let their life continue, be discontinuing, going the direction that's been going. But let them turn to you with their whole heart today. Forgive me of my many times I've failed in my responsibilities. Forgive me, Lord. Help me to do your will. Above my will, above anybody else's will. Help me to hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. Help us all to hear that, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. God. If anyone would like to pray, need prayer, we'll pray with you today. Pray for Paris, little Paris. She, her diabetes is, is high and she fell and hurt her shoulder. Her mom sent her a prayer request this morning. Let's pray for one another. I know the weather is uh, restrictive and uh, praise the Lord. The pandemic is starting to go down in our area. The numbers are starting to go down. We praise God for that. I'm I'm believing it's going to go completely away. Amen. Y'all believe that? Not because of man, but because the reality of it is going away. God's going to bring it to an end. Amen. 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 We're going to. Would you just stretch your hands as we pray for our sister this morning? If anybody else needs prayer, we'll pray for you.
Praise God. Thank you all. Praise God. Let me make a couple of announcements before we go. Um, this uh, Wednesday, uh, the Blessings Ministry will be going to Elizabethan or down here in Bristol to the place to get food to bring back for this next weekend for be food to be brought together. We help to feed people who are hungry and need uh, in need of some groceries and stuff. And so on Wednesday, they're 9:30. Uh, are y'all meeting here first and going or? Okay, so you need some people to help with the unloading on Wednesday? Okay, so if anybody wants to go with them to help with there at the place, be here at 9, 9 o'clock, be here at 9. And if you can help come and unload, uh, there are a lot of items that came last month, and I believe there will be again this month. At 11 o'clock, be here at the church to help unload. And uh, uh, Saturday will be... Uh, different ones will be helping to put things together. And uh, Sunday, for those that know of anybody or maybe you have a need, that you can take some groceries with you. And then Monday, we have it open uh, uh, for people that want to come around 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock on that Monday to come and pick up groceries as well. So uh, it's already been a blessing to a lot of people, over 100 again last month that were fed and uh and we've not even opened it up yet out into the community with the, uh, and we're going that way, that direction with it. Uh, but this will, uh, uh, if you know somebody or you have a need, that's how we're doing it right now to get a system in place more and more and, and get everything going in the right direction with it. So we praise God for that. So thank you all. Melissa and I will be gone next weekend. And so Pastor Jeff will be speaking. And uh, we're going to go get away for a weekend. And uh, if that's all right with y'all. And uh, we're, we're leaving Friday, and we'll be back Monday. So uh, we'll be praying for you, and we love you. But uh, I know Pastor Jeff is going to do an excellent job. He always does. And uh, Pastor Nathan will be leading the worship. And so y'all come on, and, and uh, we'll, we'll probably tune in with you and worship with you. But uh, come and invite somebody, bring somebody with you. It's good to see our, uh, the Bowman family back with us today. And uh, we got, praise God for all of you. All of you. Uh, remember our youth, our youth is... Uh, teens are meeting now on Wednesday nights and uh, that's just a blessing if you get a chance if you go through that hallway there and look into the, what was the old sanctuary which is now the youth and children's ministry center they've been, done some painting they've done some things in there there's some more work that we're going to be doing but anyway just take a look in there and see what has been happening uh, so it's exciting I think what we're Lord's doing some wonderful things amen God bless you have a wonderful day have a wonderful week we love you all. God bless you. Amen. Go be a trustee, a good trustee. <laughs>